Hello dudes. So, one of the most common inquiries I get from people who contact me are people who tell me that they've been on finasteride and they're concerned the drug isn't working for them. Now, in most cases, it's simply because they have not been on the drug long enough and what they're experiencing is simply a shedding phase. So what I tell them is to be patient and give it at least six months or so for the shedding to stabilize before deciding the treatment isn't working for them. However, Despite that, there are people who will tell me they've been on finasteride or even dutasteride for a duration long enough that we can probably rule out an initial shedding phase. Sometimes they've been on it for years and they are reporting that the hair loss is still happening and they're wondering why their treatment isn't working well for them anymore. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I can't say for certain why certain individuals do not respond well to treatment, but one potential culprit that isn't discussed very often when it comes to the battle against hair loss is the male hormone testosterone. Now, people who have done any kind of research on male pattern baldness will know that our main enemy in the fight against hair loss is DHT, dehydrotestosterone. That is because men who are genetically predisposed to male pattern baldness, such as myself, have more follicular sensitivity to DHT, and indeed DHT is def definitely the most destructive androgen to our hair follicles. What's not as well known, however, is that the main male hormone testosterone, while not nearly as destructive as VHT, can also harm the hair follicle either directly or indirectly, and I'd like to use this uh, video to talk about exactly how this can happen. So, we all know that testosterone is the main male hormone in the human body. It is responsible for the development and maintenance of primary and, sex and secondary sexual characteristics in men, and it is produced primarily by the testes and in smaller quantities by the pituitary gland. So when testosterone interacts with the 5A reductase enzyme, which is produced in the spine, it converts into dehydrotestosterone, DHT, which plays some important roles during sexual maturation in adolescence, but in adulthood, it is mostly useless. DHT is not active in the skeletal muscle tissue, so it doesn't play any role in the promotion of muscle or strength, and is mostly active in the skin, the prostate, and the scalp. So DHT is responsible for many of the bad things that happen to us as we age. You know, of course, I'm talking about um, you know, hair loss, acne, and an enlarged prostate, and that is why DHT is often thought of as a trash hormone. And it is important to note that uh, in adults, DHT does have a few important functions, such as in spermatogenesis, which is why sometimes men will stop finasteride when they're trying to conceive with their partners. But for most men, the suppression of DHT that comes from the use of 5A reductase inhibitors like finasteride or dutasteride will not be significant enough to cause any adverse side effects. That is why finasteride is an extremely well-tolerated drug. Its side effects are mild and they go away after discontinuation. And those who do get size can easily mitigate them by reducing their dosages and or reducing the frequency of use such as taking 0.5 milligrams every other day rather than the one milligram daily dose and evidence shows that even at reduced dosages and frequency finasteride is still an effective treatment in fighting male pattern baldness and in some countries like South Korea a quarter of a milligram is actually considered the standard dose rather than one milligram which is the standard dose in Western countries so suppressing our DHT really is a positive thing and millions of men have been prescribed finasteride asteroid since it was first approved by the FDA in 1992, and the overwhelming majority of people have had no adverse side effects whatsoever. However, for some men who use finasteride to fight hair loss, it may not be enough because of the presence of testosterone that is on the scalp, not just DHT. Finasteride and dutasteride are not direct antiandrogens. They only suppress the 5A reductase enzyme, which stops the conversion of testosterone into DHT. So they don't stop DHT directly. And this actually can cause an increase in testosterone levels, sometimes as high as 9%. So for some men who are especially sensitive to male pattern baldness, it may not be enough to just combat the DHT. They'll need to suppress all androgens on the scalp, including the testosterone. Now, unlike DHT, which can safely be suppressed systemically since it is a trash hormone, testosterone cannot be suppressed systemically without compromising our virility. Therefore, men who wish to suppress testosterone must do it locally on the scalp. So therefore, an oral antiandrogen like spironolactone is not going to be viable unless, of course, you plan to transition. Fortunately, there are viable options for suppressing androgens on the scalp topically without worrying about systemic absorption. And these include experimentals like RU5841, which I've talked about extensively. Uh, they also include upcoming treatments like Brizula, which I made a video on uh, not too long ago. And it's available uh, as CB0 301 for research purposes. And this also includes 
some currently available commercial treatments like Fluoridyl and potentially alpha tradiol, although it's possible alpha tradiol works only by suppressing DHT, even though alpha tradiol is an estrogen derivative, so it's possible that it may suppress testosterone as well since estrogens work as indirect anti-androgens. Now, I'm going to create a video discussing topical anti-androgens more in depth, but one thing I want to briefly uh, bring up about Fluoridyl is that it is a very effective topical anti-androgen and its only downside is that sourcing is pretty inconvenient unless you live in the Czech Republic, which is which is where it's commercially available. Now, you can buy it through websites like Amazon and eBay, but a lot of the time there will be stretches of the year where it's not available, which means that if you want to source it reliably, then you may have to buy large quantities of it if you don't want to not have access to it. To it for a long period of time. Now, I usually use alpha tradiol as my main topical anti-androgen as it's easier for me to source, but Fluoridyl is the stronger treatment because in studies it was shown that subjects, subjects treated with Fluoridyl, the antigen activity on the scalp increased by 75 to 86 percent compared to placebo. And for those who don't know what the antigen refers to, that is the growth phase of the scalp. Now, alpha tradiol, while it's good, it's more comparable to 2 percent minoxidil in terms of how much growth you get, although alpha tradiol is an anti androgen unlike minoxidil, so it is probably a better long-term treatment than 2% or even 5% minoxidil since minoxidil is just a uh, growth, growth stimulant. Now, speaking uh, anecdotally, I have used Fluoridyl for months at a time, even with Alphanasteride, and I have not lost any ground. So it, as a treatment, I, so it is definitely a treatment I believe in, but sadly, it is not a very reliable treatment because, like I said, it's not uh, very cheap. It's not very easy to source uh, to people unless, of course, they're living in the Czech Republic where it's commercially available. And another reason why I know Fluoridyl works is because Fluoridyl is chemically very similar to another very, very strong anti-androgen called flutamide. Now, back in the early 2010s, I was using a topical flutamide solution. And I don't know if they're available anymore. I mean, I hope not because they're really, really, uh, they're really bad. Um, and because, uh, you know, even though it definitely gave me a very noticeable hair growth, even after three months, I got some pretty bad side effects, sadly, and they were mostly sexual side effects, so I had to stop using it. Uh, Fluoridyl, on the other hand, it's it's structurally similar to flutamide, as in it's an anti-androgen, but it is also hydrophobic. So what that means is that the fluoridyl will penetrate the scalp and bind to the androgen receptor so the DHT and testosterone can't attach to it, but it won't be absorbed into the blood because it is hydrophobic, so we don't have to worry about systemic side effects. So in that regard, I think Fluoridyl is comparable to RU5841 and Brizula. Uh, there isn't really enough research for me to conclude it's more powerful or even equally powerful to either, especially since the study on Florida was pretty small and it only included about 43 people. But from personal experience and the experience of others I know who have used it, I do think it is an effective way to treat androgens on the scalp. So anyways... I'll talk about more about that later, but getting back to the subject of testosterone, we know that for most people suffering from male pattern baldness, testosterone isn't going to be an issue. Otherwise, finasteride wouldn't work in the majority of people, especially since it raises testosterone slightly. However, for some people, it's not just testosterone on the scalp that can influence uh, how detrimental it is to the hair loss, but also serum testosterone levels as well. So let me ask you guys something. How is it that someone like Jason Blaha can be bald even though he has the testosterone levels of Shirley Temple and the estrogen levels of the Spice Girls. Well, this is due to a very interesting androgen paradox where having low testosterone levels can actually cause hair loss. If you look at some people who have gone on testosterone replacement therapy, even though some do lose hair, there are others who actually report hair growth after being on testosterone replacement therapy for a, a, a a number of months. Um, and this has been be uh, because it's been demonstrated that, at least in women, that testosterone can have an anabolic effect on hair follicles. As far as the mechanism behind it, this could be due to the theory that testosterone causes an upregulation in 5A reductase activity, which results in more DHT on the scalp. But regardless of the mechanism behind it, we know that low testosterone is associated with hair loss, even though testosterone on the scalp can be damaging. Even though this hasn't been clinically proven, it's only been theorized, I think think it's likely low testosterone can actually cause an upregulation of 5A reductase activity on the scalp, which causes an increase in DH produ DH DHT production. And regardless of whether or not testosterone is d damaging someone's hair follicles, DHT will always be much worse. So that is why it is not uncommon to see men who look like they have low testosterone, like let's say Doug Walker, for instance, to be bald. And this is also why some women experience male pattern style baldness, even though they have naturally low testosterone. And that's also why you see some trans women like the YouTuber Blair White take finasteride, even though they're also suppressing their testosterone with oral spironolactone. 
So outcome is always more important than mechanism. So regardless of what the cause is, just knowing low testosterone causes hair loss is all the information we need. So men who are seeking to go on testosterone replacement therapy don't necessarily need to fear hair loss. However, one thing about TRT uh, is that it has been exploited very, very heavily by the anti-aging industry. And there are also a lot of shady anti-aging clinics out there that will hand out prescriptions for testosterone to men that are not really hypogonadal and of course hypogonadal means you have low testosterone and a lot of men who are middle-aged like me will think they are hypogonadal because they feel less energetic less virile and more out of shape compared to how they felt when they were young men and even though it's true that men do start to lose a bit of testosterone after the age of 30 the reason why men around my age feel this way uh, like they feel bad is not because of their internal chemistry but rather external factors related to their lifestyle so many men later in life you know their careers will really be taking off and you know they'll start families they'll end up becoming work workaholics they'll have a nagging wife and bratty kids who make them miserable and this results in more external stressors as well as less time to engage in healthy lifestyle lifestyle activities like exercise that made them feel better back in the day when they were younger and they'll mistakenly attribute the feelings these external stressors cause to low testosterone when in reality their testosterone is probably normal. So therefore, these men will go to these anti-aging clinics and they'll liberally prescribe testosterone, which will of course make them feel stronger and more virile, but it also may result in some very negative side effects like hair loss, uh, gynecomastia, since more testosterone will aromatize into estrogen, and also super physiological levels of testosterone can cause um, some serious health problems like uh, liver disease, heart disease. So if somebody really does suspect they have low testosterone, it is important they actually get a proper diagnosis done through a medical professional who does blood work and can confirm whether or not their patient actually has low testosterone rather than like a, a patient just self-diagnosing themselves because it'll feel good. So if indeed someone does have low testosterone, then going on TRT may actually slow down hair loss, but only if the testosterone the patient is being treated with is being used to bring testosterone uh, back to normal levels and not to super physiological levels like if they were on steroids for performance enhancement purposes. Now, in fact, uh, excess testosterone, while not as bad as DHT for the hair, can also cause hair loss. A study looking at both testosterone and DHT showed either one can cause uh, apoptosis, meaning cell death, of the dermal papilla cells, which are the cells responsible for hair growth. And, you know, I'll, there's a study on that, and I'll link that below. So even though testosterone is not exactly hair-friendly, having too little testosterone will make the problem even worse. And I point that out because, sadly, over the years, I have seen people taking ill-informed, very draconian approaches to fighting hair loss such as taking uh, oral anti-androgens like spironolactone to lower their testosterone or even abstaining from strength training because they think it will raise their testosterone and cause hair loss. And you know, I get a lot of people probably on every single video who ask me if it's safe to do resistance training because they think it will raise their androgens and cause hair loss. And this is due to a misunderstanding in the role androgens play in strength and muscle development. So when you do do strength training, what happens is you create micro tears in the skeletal muscle tissue. And while you're recovering, your body will acutely raise androgen levels to help speed up muscle protein synthesis, which will cause the contractile proteins in the skeletal muscle to repair and increase in quantity. This is called sarcoplasia, and the end result is the skeletal muscle fibers will have more and stronger contractile proteins called sarcomeres, which are controlled directly by the nervous system through motor units, units which innervate the muscle fibers whenever any kind of movement is performed. That's called an action, action potential. So yes, we do have an increase in androgens when we do resistance training, but the increase in androgens is not linear. It's algorithmic, meaning it only affects the tissues involved. I'm talking about the skeletal muscle tissues, of course. That is why you don't see women grow facial hair and get into large clitoris when they're lifting weights. Lifting weights does not compromise a woman's femininity unless, of course, they are using exogenous male hormones uh, and as performance-enhancing drugs like, you know, Dandelion Bailey. So in conclusion, I wanted to just explore this often undiscussed uh, facet in the fight against male pattern baldness because uh, even though suppressing DHT through drugs like finasteride will be good enough in well over 90% of hair loss sufferers, it is important to point out that sometimes fighting DHT is not enough and our testosterone levels, whether they be too high or too low, could also be culprits. That being said, people should assume that finasteride will be good enough for them and they shouldn't even entertain 
entertain the idea of adding a topical antiandrogen unless they've been on finasteride for at least six months, especially since, like I said at the beginning, any initial hair loss they're experiencing could just be to an initial, due to an initial shed, which we see in virtually every treatment that works, it is not something to be alarmed about. It's important that people who are suffering from hair loss get on finasteride as soon as possible, but it also uh, might help to get some blood work done first. So for instance, if your estrad estradiol levels are elevated, you may want to ask your doctor about starting finasteride on a lower dose and also maybe using it in conjunction with uh, uh, like a SARM that's called the Selective Androgen Receptor Modulator like Nolvidex or even a low dose of an aromatase inhibitor like uh, Arimidex to counter some of the potential estrogenic side effects of finasteride because since finasteride raises testosterone, it's possible some of that testosterone could aromatize into estrogen. Now, if your testosterone levels are low, then you'll still want to use Fin, of course, especially since you may have elevated 5A reductase activity on the scalp, but maybe also ask to be referred to an endocrinologist to discuss uh, testosterone replacement therapy. Now, conversely, if you have naturally very high testosterone levels, and what counts as high is something you can discuss with your endocrinologist, then maybe you should, uh, down the line, considering using both a finasteride and a topical antiandrogen like a Floridel or um, Brazula. And if you're an athlete who is considering using performance enhancement drugs, then a topical antiandrogen might also help. Although I have stressed many times before, and I will stress this again, there is no such thing as a hair safe, hair safe steroid cycle. Drugs like finasteride and minoxidil and alfragil and it's and you know etc. They're designed to fight hair loss in men with normal androgen levels. They may not work in individuals who are quadrupling or even quintupling their androgen levels through the use of exogenous androgens. So it's quite possible that no hair loss stack will be strong enough. So I highly recommend people who are considering steroids to just not freaking do it. That is unless, of course, you're being offered like some extremely lucrative multi-million dollar contract, in which case it may, may be worth it. Because, you know, other than that, no amount of muscle will ever make up for being a slaphead. So stay the hell off the cell tack. Please, it's just not worth it. So, all right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up, and I'll be back to discuss some topical antiandrogens a little bit more in depth. So, goodbye, Avita Sayonara, Disfadanya. Thank you.